Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is George Shar, and we are here with edition number two of Musical Postcards for Seniors. This show, every week, Sunday at one o'clock, and reruns throughout the week, highlights music students from Falmouth Academy. We are so honored and privileged to work with great students, and we wanted to share them with you. And what better way than to bring them right into your rooms at your local senior residences? This show is available on FCTV, other cable outlets throughout the Cape, and also streamed on YouTube, Facebook, and Vimeo. Our student today is a young student, ninth grade freshman from Martha's Vineyard. And he has already, at, the, at a very young age, he has a quite an impressive pedigree. And we're gonna talk about that and we're going to learn about him in the coming 30 minutes. But the first piece I'm gonna call on him to play is a piece by Marco Bordoni. Now, Bordoni is an Italian opera singer and our young musician is a tuba player. And you might think, what is the connection between an opera singer and why did an opera singer write for tuba? Well, Bordoni was one of the world's best operatic tenors in his age, and he lived from 1789 to 1856. Now, most of his career was spent in Paris, where he made his name, but he was famous for writing a series of vocalises, or vocalizes, for the human voice. And they're very lyrical and very uh, connected and have a beautiful flow to them. And in 1928, the principal trombonist with the Boston Symphony Orchestra, a fellow named Jean Rochou, another Frenchman, took these vocalises and transcribed them for the trombone and the tuba. So we all use these and have been using them for since 1928. And Bordoni's students have been using them before then to learn how to express ourselves through our instruments. So that being said, we all have the great honor here of hearing um, Etude Number no. 12 by Marco Bordoni, played on the tuba by Matteo Derrick. Please welcome Matteo Derrick. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Mateo, that was lovely. Oh my goodness. And, and to hear such melody, <laughs> I love that smile. And to hear such melody coming out of that big instrument, the tuba, you really make that sing. You have had quite a career already. You're in the ninth grade at Falmouth Academy. How old are you? I'm 15. You're 15 years old. Oh my goodness, that's great. Well, so let's talk about some obvious things, first of all, before we tell our audience here where you are today. Um, what made you choose the tuba? Let's start with that. I mean, who, who plays the tuba? And you play it so masterfully. What? Thank you. Um, I chose the tuba because, well, it's a funny reason, actually, because in fourth grade, we were told to choose an instrument, so I chose to play the euphonium, which is similar to the tuba, but it plays a little higher, because uh, I just thought it had a cool name. I had no idea what it was. And then I saw this big thing in the music store, and we brought it home, and I, I thought it sounded really cool. I really liked it. And then I heard the tuba play for the first time by my friend, and I just thought that was even cooler. It had an, a big open sound. I just loved it, so I had to switch. I knew I had to learn tuba, and now here I am. So you, as a, as a little guy, and and now you know you're taller than me now. And I remember when we met several years ago, you were you were a little guy, and I'm not a big person, but now you're tall and you've grown into the tuba. So you actually started on the euphonium. And, and I think we have a picture here in our files here of you playing the euphonium. And what the audience is seeing now is something that you sent to me in a Christmas card. I thought it was wonderful. And it's a picture of you sitting on a dock in Martha's Vineyard because you live on the vineyard. And you're playing, actually in this picture, I think you're playing your tuba. Yeah, I was. But we're going to, thank you. But we're also going to show a picture of you playing uh, the baritone horn. And I think you're in the fourth grade in this picture. And our audience can see your size relative to the instrument. It's just, uh, it's a big instrument. And your, of course, your tuba is even much larger than it is now. So um, you switched over to the tuba because you fell in love with the sound. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Yeah. And, and here you are making a beautiful sound. So how many years have you been playing? Well, well, I've been, I've been playing since fourth grade, but I switched over to tuba in the middle of fifth grade. So that makes it, I'd say, three and a half, four years. Only four years. Now, let's tell our audience about some of your recent successes. So for starters, you, you used to play, or do you still play with the Vineyard Haven Town Band? Tell yeah, us about yeah. that. So what's that like? Uh, that's great. It's We play all these very popular marches particularly a lot of Sousa marches, um, then some just uh, random band songs. But we I've been doing that since the summer after sixth grade. So this will be my third summer, I believe. No, this will be my fourth summer with them. Um, I'm usually gone at camp for a little bit of it. But we'll play every Sunday. We'll, we will have a concert either in Oak Bluffs in this big gazebo. It's like an amphitheater, yeah. And then in Vineyard Haven, we'll play in a little a little mini one and it'll rotate every other week. So, now yeah. for, for, our, our, for our audience members, especially those that have played an instrument, what's remarkable about playing in a town band is that you play a lot of music, right? Yes, lots of music. Lots and lots of music. So you play every week during the summertime and your book is probably about this thick, right? Yeah. So for a young musician to be invited to play in the town band is quite an honor. And what it does as a young musician is it helps you do what's called sight read. And that is to play music right the first time you see it. So congratulations. Well, so now we met about, uh, I think we met probably three or four years ago when you came to our summer camp at Falmouth Academy. And then you started this in the seventh grade at Falmouth Academy. And you play in our jazz band and you play in our symphonic ensemble. You're even playing in the string ensemble this year because we don't have a double bass player. So you play so beautifully and so mellow, we've brought you in to round out the string ensemble. That is fabulous. Now, you, you didn't stop there. Uh, a couple of wonderful things happened. You, you got accepted into the district, the District Massachusetts um, Festival. And from district, the best musicians were chosen to audition for Allstate. And what happened? What was that like? Uh, yeah, it was a lot of work. I prepared the audition solo, uh, had a couple movements. I worked on scales and over a few months I got it all down and then came the audition. I thought it went pretty well. Mm -hmm. 
it did go pretty well because I was with you on that day, although I wasn't in the room. They wouldn't let our music teachers in the room. They were judged by other professional tuba players, by the way, to our audience. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mateo in the ninth grade made Allstate. So he is one of the best high school tuba players in the state of Massachusetts. Now you played someplace special as a result of playing in Allstate. Where, where did you play? Was it like the gazebo in, uh, in, in no, where was that? <clears throat> where did you play? I was at Symphony Hall. You, you played at Boston Symphony Hall. And I remember it was March 7th of this year, 2020. In fact, it was one of the last of the events not to be canceled because of COVID. And uh, it was just starting to break out. And, and after that, a lot of events got canceled. We're gonna show our audience now a picture of you playing in uh, Symphony Hall. And here you are on the stage with the symphonic band. And that was, I was in the audience, of course. And you'll also see your father, Adam here, who's taken a picture of you up in the balcony. It was just wonderful. And you played second tuba in the band. And there were a lot of tubas. And again, you're only 15. I think the person that played first tuba was a young woman, as I recall, and maybe a junior or a senior. She was right? a senior. Yeah. So with any luck, next year you'll be maybe in the top spot because I know you practice an awful lot. Now, you also play in another famous youth orchestra. Tell us what that is and what that's about. Uh, yeah, so I play um, with the Boston Youth Symphony Orchestras. They have many different orchestras. I'm in their second orchestra, which is called the Repertory Orchestra. Um, and it's a really great time. I auditioned for that last spring and was accepted and have been rehearsing with them every Sunday until recently because of COVID. Um, we rehearse, we rehearse for a while. We go over different pieces. They give us a lot of repertoire. Uh, it's really fun. I'm the only tuba in the orchestra because orchestras only have one tuba player. So I'm there with the trombone section and it's a really fun time. Isn't that wonderful? That is true. Orchestras uh, do only have one tuba player. And, you know, we have a lot of connections. The conductor of your orchestra is Mark Miller. And for those of you in the audience that go to the Cape Symphony Orchestra, you'll know me as the bass trombonist in the symphony and Mark Miller as the principal clarinetist. And he is also Matteo's conductor. And Mark is so thrilled to have you in that orchestra, Matteo. He just, he thanks me all the time. So you play in two of the highest level orchestras in the region. And again, you're only in the ninth grade. So that is incredible, incredible success. Um, what, so what do you do, attribute your success? I have, I have an idea, I have a couple ideas, but I wanted, what do you think? Well, I mean, I haven't gotten there yet, but where I am so far, I would definitely like to give a lot of thanks to all of my music teachers that I've had, including you. Ah, um, oh, too nice. <laughs> my first music teacher, her name is Julie Schilling. She also happens to be the conductor of the town band that I play in in the summer. Um, she's a great woman. She's super nice. She helped me keep going, practicing. She used to give me lessons. I, I give a lot of my um, success so far to her. And yeah. um, after that, I had an online teacher named Christian. He really helped me um, through my first like real private lessons as a tuba player. And then when I since I've came to Falmouth Academy, uh, you have helped me go and um, follow my goals. And so I've been a lot more successful thanks to your encouragement. And then also my private teacher, Phil Haig, who used to play principal trumpet with the Cape Symphony and Plymouth Symphony. So, so Phil Haig is a colleague of mine and Mark Miller's. Phil Haig is the long time, over 30 years, principal trumpet with the Cape Symphony. And I bet a lot of our audience members have heard him play over the, over the years. He has, play, he has played hundreds, hundreds, and hundreds, and hundreds and hundreds of concerts, concerts for many, many thousands of people. Um, and he's a dear friend. And he is your private teacher. That is that is correct. He's a wonderful, wonderful player. So um, let's talk now a little bit about the role of the tuba in the orchestra, one of my favorite instruments as well. So most of us, when we think of the tuba, we think of what we might call an oompa band. Like, you know, like, uh, like a German song or a beer drinking song or a two beat or a dance tune. But in the symphony orchestra, the tuba does get a whack of the melody every once in a while. So would you play a couple of excerpts that our audience might know, symphonic excerpts that you might play? Um, and I think you're gonna play the Ride of the Valkyries, and a lot of us know that. 
and I believe you're going to play uh, an excerpt from Scheherazade. <laughs> Mateo, that was awesome. That was awesome. I loved it. You know, the first thing I notice about the tuba is it's a powerful instrument. How do you get such, how do you, how do you get such a big sound out of that? You're a little guy. Does, uh, yeah, it take a, yeah. does it take a lot of air? That's what our audience wants to know. Does it take a lot of air? It does take a lot of air, but there are things you can do to maximize the amount of air you can take in and use. Um, my private teacher, Mr. Haig, has taught me a lot of things to do with that. And I usually, in my warm up, I will do those exercises to prepare myself to um, get as much air and utilize it as well as possible. Yeah, it, that, that is wonderful. Um, and I also know that you just recently, within the last couple of months, got your braces off, right? So you've been playing tuba with braces for how many years? Five, I don't know, two, three? Right. And so that must have been, it, I'm sure it was a real a difficult transition to get used to the position of that mouthpiece on your, uh, on your mouth um, without the braces, I'm sure. So you have a very special um, segment coming up now that you want to play for our audience. And uh, what is it that you'd like to play next? I'm going to play the piccolo solo from Stars and Stripes Forever by John well, Philip Sousa. I, I didn't know that you played piccolo. Oh, you're going to play it on the tuba? Yeah. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Isn't that the part that goes... We have a clip here. I want to remind our audience what they're about to see. The clip that we're going to show you now, by the way, the kudos to our engineer. This is a student-run program, Marcus Greco. Marcus Greco, who's off-site right now, you'll get to meet him in a future broadcast. He's going to play for you a clip right now of the West Point Band playing the piccolo solo, which is probably, it is, the most famous piccolo solo in all of repertoire. <laughs> professional trombonist and I don't think I've ever heard the piccolo solo played on a tuba before. That was just amazing. Now to most of our audience out there, I would bet when you hear that on the piccolo, you probably think of Arthur Fiedler and the Boston Pops. Um, Arthur Fiedler of course created the genre of the Pops here right in Boston and the Boston Pops is the most famous of the Pops orchestras in the world. Of course now conducted by Keith Lockhart. Um, Matteo, we have, we've talked m much today about the Boston Symphony Orchestra and uh, its, its affiliated orchestra, the Boston Pops, and, and you and I both have multiple connections 
with the symphony. And something I only learned recently, that you, you also have a heritage of, of the love of the symphony. Your great grandparents loved the symphony orchestra. And they would go, to, are, you, are, you, are you aware of this, I think, right? This, yeah. uh, your, father, your father has told me about this. And I think your great grandmother, and your great grandmother is alive today. And how old is she? Yeah, she is 100 years old. She's 100 years old. <laughs> so she was born in 19, 1920 or 1919? Yeah. Yep. Well, she is going to be so proud of you. She and your great grandfather, who was a jazz lover, a yeah. Dixieland lover in particular, right? Mm -hmm. They would go to Symphony Hall and listen to the concerts. And I understand when your dad was a young man, he would go to your great grandparents' house. They say this would be his gra grandparents and they would listen to jazz records by the fireplace. Well, that's a wonderful story. And your great grandmother is going to be very proud of you. What, what is her name? Uh, we call her, I call her Great Mimi, but her friends call her Hookie. Cookie, I love it. Well, Cookie, this is for you. So thank you so much, Mateo. Mateo, you are just such an amazing young man and I can't believe you're 15 years old. <laughs> And as I told our audience, I have the pleasure of working with this young guy uh, every day. In fact, uh, very often during study hall, uh, study hall teachers don't pay attention to this. He'll come down and he practices in the music room. So it's just like a college atmosphere over there at Falmouth Academy. And we have some very um, high powered musicians. And now that we have a beautiful dedicated performing arts space called the Simon Center for the Arts and the Herman Theater, uh, Mateo has access to that space every day. And, and by the way, part of the reasons for your success are your, not only your talent, but just as importantly is your drive and your discipline. I see you practice every day, even when you're not feeling well. And that is uh, kudos to you. So now I want to talk about non-music. So what do you do when you, now I know you practically sleep with the tuba because you love the tuba and you love music, right? It goes with you everywhere. And by the way, that is a big case. On Mateo's first day of school, I went down in the bus to pick him up because his instrument was so big, it wouldn't fit through the, the door. We weren't sure it was gonna fit through the door of the, uh, of the regular school bus that goes to pick him up. So, and while we're on that topic, you come over from Falmouth Academy, from the vineyard to Falmouth Academy every day. What time do you have to get up in the morning? Yeah, I, I typically get up at about six o'clock, get ready, and then we're out of the house by six fifty, six forty-five. Now, do you live in Vineyard Haven? Yes. So you have to drive about um, maybe a mile or two to get to the ferry. Yeah, just a couple minutes. All right, and then Dad takes you to the ferry, and you leave your tuba at school typically, so you don't have to take that back and forth, and you practice at school. That's a smart idea. And, and uh, how many kids come over from the vineyard? Like one or two? No, many more. About I, I know the answer to this. Yeah. How many? About 40. 40? Yeah. I, I think this year there are 43 kids coming over from Martha's Vineyard to Falmouth Academy. And Falmouth Academy is a day school. So these students come over on the 7 o'clock ferry, and we send a bus down to pick them up at 7.45, and they're back at school at 8 or 8.05, and we start our first class at 8.15. Unfortunately, we're now in distance learning mode, and we have been for several weeks, so all classes are online. So the Vineyard kids get to sleep in until, what time, 7 o'clock, 7.30? You can, you can sleep in an extra hour. <laughs> so what do you do when you're not playing music? What, what, are, you, what are your hobbies? Uh, well, I have a few. Right now, I can't really go out and do things out really far out of the house, but I like to take walks and um, ob observe, but also in the house, I, I have a whole collection of plants, maybe like 20-something plants in my room. So you, you're like a, a botanist? Yeah, I really like botany. It's, I just find it really interesting, and, I, and cuttings and propagation and just all sorts of different plants, fruiting plants, house plants, foliage. They're all just really interesting. We also have uh, a chemistry teacher, Dr. Yanch, who is very interested in botany. Did you know that? Yeah, her and I talk about plants sometimes. Oh, good, because I have a big hibiscus right next to my desk. I also love plants, 
And if I have a big hibiscus next to my desk, and I mean, here's a little plant right here, but I surround myself with plants as you do too. In fact, right now I'm gonna ask Marco to, Marcus to put up a, uh, a picture of your uh, workstation at home because you're distance learning. You have, um, you, have a st you have a little desk with a blue chair behind it and you look at, you've surrounded yourself with plants. And if the audience could see around here, in fact, um, you can just, this is the hibiscus tree I was just telling you about. You can see it right over here and you can see an orchid up on the mantle. Um, so I also find plants. So now you mentioned cuttings. Um, what is that like? Do you, um, uh, how, what is, how does a cutting work? Well, you, what you do is you take a long, usually a long section of a, of a plant or even a branch and you cut, out, cut it off right under a leaf node and you remove the bottom leaves and you can stick it right in water or sometimes right in the soil and within a few weeks or a couple months that cutting will be growing a, a whole new plant. Isn't that something? Fascinating. So, Matteo, you're a fascinating young man. So not only music, and, and we've always known that music is your, your first love, and it, it clearly shows, and botany, but you're an athlete as well. What do you do athletically at school and, and at home? Well, let's see. So well, this fall, I um, was in the cross-country club. It's new as of this year with Falmouth Academy. Um, I'm hoping that they're, they're going to have a varsity team next year as well. So I'm going to try to do that again next fall. We might even try to do something with track. Who, who knows? Where it's just I'm um, getting off the ground. But I just I find cross country to be really exciting. You get to see uh, the landscape around you, and you get to run through it and feel good. So. And that must be good for you for building up your air power, right? Yeah, in a way. <laughs> and you're also interested in science, right? You're a science guy. Yeah, I really like um, biology, chemistry, physics, you can, anything really, I, I really like a lot of sciences, but I recently have been working in a lab um, with a scientist in Woods Hole, and we've been studying, or we were supposed to study um, some samples from the Arctic that she took, so we could look at how the ecosystems are being affected by climate change, essentially. Mm -hmm. You know, Falmouth Academy is proud to be associated with uh, many, if not all, of the scientific organizations in Woods Hole. And we have internships and partnerships, and uh, they're very good to us. And our annual science fair, which is the third week in February, there's over 100 scientists that come and act as judges. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes, and we are sad to go, but this concludes uh, episode two of Musical Postcards for Seniors. We're gonna let Matteo Derrick play us out with a uh, lovely inspirational song. This song you'll all know, it was written by John Newton and written in uh, 1772 and published in 1779. Uh, John was actually, uh, wrote this out of personal experience. He was a passenger on a ship and the ship was, was uh, ran into a storm and he, he prayed for salvation and to be rescued from the storm. And the ship was saved. And as a result, he became a transformed man and, and brought religion into his life and wrote this song um, published in 1779 called Amazing Grace. So until next week, when we see you again, ladies and gentlemen, Matteo Derrick, Amazing Grace. Mm -hmm.